Hi, Pastor McMurtry. I appreciate you taking the time to address my questions. And even though we may never agree or completely agree on this topic, I hope this video gives you a better understanding at least of what I believe. Now, I may not always be looking at the camera because I've got some notes in front of me. So if I'm just looking at the screen, it's because I'm reading my notes. Now, I believe God is both three persons and one person at the same time. And I believe I've been very clear in stating this and I'm not intentionally trying to confuse or deceive anyone. Um, so what I believe is in light of God being three persons, I believe there are distinctions between the three. But I also believe in light of God being one person, there is no distinction at the same time. So this video response will sound like I only believe God is one person because this is the side of the Trinity I'm defending in this video. But I want to be clear that I also believe that God is three persons at the same time. I see the nature of, of the Godhead as a paradoxical truth, and it's just something that we need to accept by faith. And I'm fine with that because I don't believe God's nature needs to fit within the realm uh, of our human logic. Now, I don't question or have any concerns about my salvation because I'm worried that you don't think I'm saved. I just don't appreciate being lied about. Um, especially when we probably believe exactly the same thing on the gospel and you're basing um, your opinion on something false. You know, you're, you're trying to say that, you know, I don't understand the spiritual aspect of Jesus' words when I believe I do. So I'm just confronting you on the incor incorrect statements that you're making publicly. So I don't think that's something that is unreasonable. Now, I wrote to you on Facebook that my sermon raised five questions. Now, these weren't the only questions I wanted you to answer. I wanted your explanation for all the verses I raised in the sermon. Um, you asked me twice on Ronnie, uh, Donnie Romero's um, Facebook thread to email them to you. So I just pointed you to the sermon itself and you can get them from there. So I'll go over some of them again in this video because there were some you still haven't addressed. And I'll also raise uh, some other verses and questions I think the Orthodox Trinity view has trouble dealing with. So I'll deal with the physical versus spiritual issue first, since that's the main basis for why you're saying I'm either unsaved or I'm a deceiver. So the physical versus the spiritual issue. Now your video didn't address the response I wrote on Donnie Romero's Facebook. You know, you just repeated what I had already responded to. Um, so I'll go over my points again, just for the people watching this video. Now I don't deny that there is a spiritual aspect to the things that Jesus said but I don't think you've completely thought through your argument either. In John 6, 48, Jesus says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Now, the first thing is Jesus didn't say he was physical bread. He said he was the spiritual bread of life. Um, and he contrasted that to the physical bread, which was the manna. But Jesus is that spiritual bread. You know, you wouldn't say Jesus is not the bread of life, would you? Just because he's speaking spiritually. In John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So the second thing is Jesus never said he was a physical, you know, door for sheep, you know, on a physical farm. He said he was the spiritual door you know, that we must enter to be saved. And Jesus is that spiritual door. Um, you know, you wouldn't say Jesus is not the door to salvation, would you, just because he's speaking spiritually there? So Jesus is the spiritual bread and Jesus is the spiritual door. But what you're saying is all of a sudden in John 10 and John 14, Jesus is not the spiritual father, even though he makes the statements, I and my father are one, and if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So Jesus in the flesh is the physical manifestation of the things he is spiritually. So I agree that we are spiritually seeing the father, uh, you know, when we see Jesus, but it's because Jesus is that spiritual father manifest in the flesh and also the word that was with the Father in the beginning. If, if we look at John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And we know God talked about in John 1.1 1, 1 is the Father. Because if we compare 1 John 1, um, we can see, we can read here, 
that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So John 1, 1 John 1 says that the word of life was with the Father, and John 1 says the word was with God, but it also says the word was God. Now this is an interesting verse that I'd like you to explain. John 12, verse 44 and 45. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Now, if Jesus is just saying, if you believe me, you believe the Father because we say the same things. How would you explain this first? If Jesus is not also him that sent me. I mean, he's saying, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And this is a similar thing in, in John 5, 24, a very familiar passage to us. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So I'd like to hear an explanation from you on John 12, 44 to 45. Now let's go on to the water of life. Now you acknowledge now that Jesus didn't say that he was physical water, nor did he uh, even say that he was the spiritual living water or the water of life. So uh, that's fine there if you, if you acknowledge that now. Um, so what he did say is that he would give the woman at the well living water and he contra he actually contrasted it to physical water so in john 4 10 jesus answered and said unto her if thou knewest the gift of god and who it is that saith to thee give me to drink thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water uh, john 4 we skip down a couple of verses jesus answered and said unto her whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again so you see how he's contrasting it to the actual physical water but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now we know that that spiritual living water is, um, that he gives is the Holy Spirit. Because if we compare that to John 7, 38, 39, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake of the Spirit, which uh, they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now what's interesting about this is if we compare this to Revelation chapter 21, 5 and 6, we read here, and he that sat upon the throne, so he that sat upon the throne is the one that's about to speak here, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Look at this. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, if Jesus is he that sat upon the throne, giving the water of life in Revelation, then my question to you is, who is the Lamb in Revelation? Now let's go on to um, Isaiah 9, 6 and the issues surrounding that. Now I don't deny that there are many earthly fathers, but I do believe when it comes to spiritual fathers, there is only one spiritual father. Matthew 23 verse 9, Jesus says very clear, clearly, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Now you referenced 1 Corinthians 4, um, chapter 4, verse 15, to show that we have more, we can, we can have more than one spiritual father. 1 Corinthians 4, 15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now I wouldn't be so quick to say Paul is a spiritual father like the Catholics and the Orthodox do. Um, you should compare these scriptures here. I've got... 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, But we were gentle among you, so this is Paul talking to the Thessalonians, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So Paul is saying that he's like a nurse giving suck to her children. Galatians 4.19, My little children, look at what Paul says here, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. 
Now, why is he saying travailing in birth again? It's because he travailed in birth the first time to try and get them saved. Now, why is he saying travail in birth if he sees himself as a spiritual father? It, it's usually the mother, it's, not usually, it is always the mother that is travailing in birth. So it sounds like Paul sees himself as the mother of this spiritual relationship, not the father. Now, there is only one spiritual father, and we as believers, we act as the spiritual mother in this spiritual begetting of spiritual children. And this is why as bishops, we take care of God's house. You know, we take care of God's children. And when we preach, think about this, when we preach basic Bible doctrine, we are feeding God's children with the sincere milk of the word. So someone might, you know, another argument might be, uh, so yeah, so like I said, I don't think Paul is saying that he is a spiritual father. I think he's, he, he understands that he is a uh, spiritual mother to these people. He, that's why he can say he's begotten them through the gospel, but he's begotten them in Christ Jesus because Christ Jesus is that one spiritual father that we have in heaven. Now, someone might say, well, isn't Abraham, isn't Abraham our father? Um, Romans 4, 16, therefore it is of faith, and I think there's the clue there, that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all, uh, all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So I don't think that's teaching that Abraham is our spiritual father. It's teaching that Abraham is the father of our faith. He's not the father of us. He didn't beget us spiritually, but he was the one that the promise was made to and that made him the father of faith. Um, now compare this to Isaiah 63, 16. It says, doubtless, so without any doubt, thou art our father, talking to God, right? Though Abraham be ignorant of us and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. Now that sounds like ever the everlasting father in Isaiah 9, 6. Now another question for you is, how is there only one father in heaven if Jesus is also in heaven and is our father too? John 3, 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So if Jesus is just another father, why is the everlasting father in Isaiah 9, 6 the only phrase in that verse that uses the definite article the but he's not the only one. I mean, people aren't spending whole sermons, you know, response videos trying to explain that Jesus is just a mighty God to us or just another Prince of Peace to us. You know, the word the would imply that there is only one. But if God the Father and Jesus are both the everlasting Father and they're not each other also, then you have two the everlasting fathers. You know, I think that's, that's pretty simple. If the everlasting father is a title that can apply just to God in general, you know, why does the verse only mention the son that is born? You know, unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given. It seems like this is being read into the verse, but it isn't actually there of, of its own accord. Another issue is, you know, how do you explain, um, these are verses that you didn't address in your video. I mean, how do you explain 1 John 3 that teaches the father was manifested to take away our sins? In 1 John 3, 1, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, right, the sons of God, because it knew him not. Now, is that him, isn't that him referring to the Father that's mentioned in the same verse? And as we go on, Beloved, now we the sons of God, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, and we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now in verse one, the he, him is already referring to the father. Why would it all of a sudden switch in verse two? And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Then we get to verse five, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So at this point, has the he just switched to somebody else other than the father? Verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, some people are saying that the he in verse 5 is talking about Jesus. Now, is this how grammar works? Like, you know, can we just go back to any subject we want that fits our doctrine and, you know, and make that the antecedent, even though a he has already been used in reference to the Father in verse 1? 
Um, I don't think that's how it works. And it's not just Jesus that verse one would fit because it also applies to the Father. Because somebody might say, well, you know, what about in John 1.10 where it says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. And they say, well, obviously John, 1 John 3.1 is talking about Jesus. Well, no, because that also applies to the Father, the fact that the world doesn't know him. John, uh, Jesus said in John 17.25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Now I've heard people say that the Son of God manifesting in, is mentioned in verse 8, and therefore it's obvious that it's referring to Jesus. Now, you know, do pronouns point to antecedents um, that have not even been mentioned yet? Is that how grammar works? And, and you know, verse 6, again, another point, says if you've sinned, you haven't seen or known him, but people that have sinned have seen Jesus. Now you'll say, well, it's because it's a spiritual thing. And I agree with you, but then that would also apply to the Father. So that still doesn't get you away from the he in that passage in 1 John 3, being God the Father who is mentioned in, uh, in verse 1. John 14, 7, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Now, if Jesus just being another father to us in Isaiah 9, 6 is supposedly so easy to understand. Um, and, you know, they say, if you don't understand it, you know, you must be some unsaved homosexual reprobate. My question to you is, you know, why was no one in the new IFB movement interpreting it this way prior to Tyler Baker being fired? I mean, can you provide me with just one clip from any sermon from one of the big name preachers in the new IFB movement who preached it this way prior to this whole controversy. I mean, there's plenty of footage of them preaching what would now be labeled as modalistic heresy. And you, you, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a one hour video someone put together of all those clips. So I can put a link in the description for you. But why do you think this is the case? If it's so easy to understand um, and only unsaved people don't get it. All right, so let's go on to 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 16. The Bible reads that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. Amen. Now, I think you completely missed the issue here. You know, the question you need to answer is, who is the whom no man hath seen nor can see referring to? You know, is it the light or is it the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Now, I believe this is referring to Jesus because Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But just to be clear, we're not saying Jesus hasn't been seen as a man, you know, obviously Jesus was manifest in the flesh. You know, that's the straw man argument everyone is saying. We're saying Jesus in his deity, no man hath seen nor can see. So it's another shared attribute Jesus has with the Father supporting the fact that they are also one person. Now it sounds like from your video response that you believe it's a reference to God the Father, whom no man hath seen nor can see, uh, since you cross reference it with Exodus 33. So I'll just go there. Exodus 33, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will pro proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Now let's continue to read. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and look at this, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So another question for you is, did Moses see the back parts of God the Father? You know, I thought he was invisible. I thought according to you, you could only see him spiritually. Now, here's another question for you. You know, is Jesus the light or is he the one dwelling in the light? You know, John 1, 9 says, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, talking about Jesus. But if Jesus is the one dwelling in the light, according to you, then explain why 1 John 1, 5, 7 says God the Father is the light and he's the one dwelling in the light. We'll go to 1 John 1, 5. 
This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him we, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, referring to the God that is light, we have fellowship one with another. And how do I know this is referring to God the Father? Because now it says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that he is referring to the God that is light and the God that is dwelling in the light that he is. It says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So you'll need to explain, if you believe Jesus is the one dwelling in the light, why does 1 John 1, 5 say it's God the Father dwelling in the light? Um, and that God the Father, who is the light, who's dwelling in the light, has a son who is Jesus Christ. The other thing you need to explain is why in Revelation 21, 22 to 23, it says the Lamb is the light of the one dwelling in the light. Revelation 21. 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And look at this, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So if Jesus is the Lamb and he's the light that is coming off the glory of God, then it can't be, you know, can it be Jesus dwelling in the light if you don't believe Jesus and God the Father are the same person as well? So I understand that Jesus is given authority from the Father. But if God the Father is also the King Eternal from 1 Timothy 1.17, as you explained, how is Jesus King of Kings if there's a King above him that's not him as well? So you may need to explain that one to me again. All right, let's go on to uh, how many saviors there are. Now, if, if there's two persons that are saviors, and they're not also each other, how do you make sense of Isaiah 43, 10 to 13? It says, Yeah, my witnesses saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Now that's an important passage, and you probably know why. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no saviour. Now, how many people does it sound like are talking here? This is one person, very clear. I, I, me. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, look at this, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So if we compare this to what Jesus said in John 8, 24. He said, I said therefore unto you, ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So according to Jesus, he was the person speaking in Isaiah 43. Um, but how can he say there is no savior or God beside him when you've got God the Father who is a savior and God, but who is never the same person as Jesus as well. So that's something you'll need to explain. Uh, I think the answer is in John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So now that would make sense of Isaiah 43, you know, that there are two separate hands, but at the same time, they're the one hand. So I'm not trying to I'm not trying to cause confusion. You know, I'm just raising issues that support my position on the Godhead. You know, I believe the Bible clearly teaches there is only one savior and even though there is a distinction between Jesus and the Father, if Jesus is not also the Father at the same time, then you have two saviors. And you know, I feel like I'm having the same conversation I have with Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, and I'm not saying this invalidates your view, you know, just because they explain verses the same way you do, but I've just never heard these kinds of explanations com coming from Bible-believing Baptists. So let's go on to the next topic, you know, is God one spirit? Now, you say in your video that you may have missed the point of this question and with all due respect I, I think you have um, because I'm not saying my point was not that there isn't more than one spirit that exists at all um, the question is is God more than one spirit and you said in your video there is not more than one spirit that is God 
And you know, that's my point. So you, know, you can't use my point to refute my position. Um, then you reinforce that point by quoting 1 Corinthians 12, 13, saying the one spirit is the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Amen and amen, I agree with you. Uh, so what I want you to explain then is why God the Father is a spirit, but you also believe he's not the Holy Spirit. John 4, 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. So who is he talking about here? The Father. And they that worship him, because it's the Father that's seeking worship, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if you believe there's only one spirit, and that spirit is the Holy Spirit, and there's only one spirit that is God, but you don't believe the Holy Spirit is God the Father, how can God the Father be a spirit? You've got the same problem with Jesus. John, um, let's go on to um, Romans 8. So you need to explain then why Jesus is that spirit of liberty who dwells in us, but you also believe he's not the Holy Spirit, but yet you believe there's only one spirit that is God. Romans 8. This one will, will surely mess with your mind. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. So that's the Holy Spirit, right? Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And look at this. Now, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So that spirit that is in us is Jesus Christ. But look at this in verse 11 now. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, whose spirit is that talking about? That's now God the Father, because God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And it's saying the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. And again, 2 Corinthians 3, um, reading from verse 14. But their minds were blinded for until, the day re until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, it needs to turn to Jesus Christ, right? To remove that veil, the veil shall be taken away. Now look at this. Now this is probably the verse that the name of your church is based on. Now the Lord is that spirit. Now who's the Lord that it's talking about that they need to turn to? Jesus Christ. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So explain that one to me. Now let's go on to the name of, um, uh, well, I won't address the name of the Father. I won't address this point in this video because I don't think it's relevant to the discussion between you and me, but it was relevant to the people in my church. Um, but what was the point of my sermon, Trinity Confusion? You know, was it to cause confusion? Of course not. That's a silly question. The whole point of my sermon was to explain why there is confusion and to explain that there is an area of mystery that is difficult to explain. I mean, even you would acknowledge that because you don't even believe the same thing as Donnie Romero on the three persons within the Godhead, that, you know, there's three different bodies, different souls, different spirits, different minds, etc. So there is room for a difference of opinion without being a modalist heretic. Um, and I believe I do state my positions clearly, you know, that God is both three persons with distinctions, but at the same time, one person without these distinctions. And I believe this is the paradox of God's nature that we just have to accept by faith. And I believe it's the position that fits all the scriptures that we see in the Bible. Now, whether you understand my position or not, is another question, but for those calling me a modalist heretic, they obviously do not. Now, I'd be happy to discuss each of these issues point by point with you um, on a recorded video call, if that's something you wanna do, because I believe we've both stated our case and I don't think it would be profitable or productive to just continue to go back and forth with separate video responses. So let me know if you're willing to chat face to face, I'd be more than happy to. Um, so I appreciate your time watching this video. Thanks.